afternoon to some evening to others and potentially good morning to some people who are with us from the other side of the pond. I'm Torin Constanson, I'm Chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce and with great pride bring you another in our series of The Global Citizen. This is a series that we've run since I think about April, May this year and this year we'll be talking about the vaccine story Global, how the Global South is going to develop its own solutions in the vaccine environment. We have got our interviewer and in conversation host, who is Professor Francis Peterson. He will be joining us. Thank you very much, Francis, for joining, coming on, on the screen. I'd like to first of all start by introducing you to Francis, who has a bio second to none. So I'm going to praise it big time, which he has asked me to do as well. Uh, he has been the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Free State since April 2017. Formerly, he's, prior to that, he's been with the University of Cape Town, been with Anglo American Platinum, Mintech, Cape Technicon, and has studied vastly uh, his original study in chemical engineering being from the University of Stellenbosch. He's a recipient of the Ernest Oppenheimer Memorial Trust and Cape Te Technicon Researcher of the Year Awards. That goes to show how different Professor Peterson is for me. He goes into research, I'm into practical, which makes us so different. And I find him absolutely fascinating because he's got a DNA so different to mine. So I find his uh, insights and his conversations very, very powerful. Um, I think probably at this point, Professor Peterson, I'm probably going to hand over to you and ask you to tell us a little bit about our guest who's about to arrive with us any moment and about the whole development of this vaccine story and how South Africa is being as, so innovative and groundbreaking in this process, in this, in this, in this field. Thank you very much, Sharon, and it's always a pleasure. And uh, again, thank you for hosting us here on, on, on this particular platform. Absolute pleasure. Uh, we, 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 we have Patrick Sunshiong. Uh, now, Patrick Sunshiong is a South African-born physician. He's a, he's a surgeon, he's a philanthropist, he's a scientist, he's an inventor, and he's also a businessman. Um, and, and he devoted his career to understanding the fundamental biology driving life-threatening diseases uh, and translating these insights into medical innovations uh, with a global impact. Um, so he, at the moment, serves as a chairperson uh, and chief executive officer of Nant Works, a multinational conglomerate with deep understanding in a wide variety of complex industries, you know, from medical science to physics, uh, from data to artificial intelligence, and also from communication to mobility. Um, and and, and the, um, the story around Patrick uh, is actually Professor uh, uh, Patrick Sun uh, he was He was born in, uh, in, in, uh, um, um, in Port Elizabeth, so he's now Kobacha uh, in South Africa. And um, he then graduated in the medical school at Wits University. And he decided that uh, he wanted to pursue an academic career, uh, but he, he, he first worked in South Africa and then pursued an academic career outside the country. But he also made the move from academia to the private sector. Uh, um, and Sharon earlier talked about uh, the difference between uh, myself and her. She's more practical in a way. Uh, I can also just say, uh, 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 Sharon, I also spent quite a bit of time in the industry. And I must say, uh, being in both part uh, of academia and business, uh, um, it, 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 it opens, opens up a, uh, a far greater understanding of the need for, uh, 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 from the business side, from the industry side, from the private sector side, and also what could be provided from the academic side, from academia. And I think that alignment, that understanding uh, um, is quite crucial to be able to make a meaningful difference uh, um, in society. And that's the road that, that Patrick Sun Siong has, 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 has followed. Uh, um, he, I think he was, he was out of the country for about 21 or 25 years uh, uh, um, out of South Africa. And um, 
And he decided that he wants to come back to, to South Africa uh, to be able to assist the country in terms of vaccine development, uh, not only in the area of, 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 of say, COVID-19, but also vaccine development in the area of cancer uh, and other diseases that, uh, that plague not only South Africa or the African continent, but also the globe. And, and, and having that knowledge that he picked up uh, across different parts of the world and also understanding the business, he, his, 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 his focus is to see to what extent he could leapfrog uh, uh, um, the, African tech, uh, the African continent uh, um, to be able to become uh, not only competitive, but also a provider uh, of, of vaccine, uh, obviously first to the continent, but also to the globe. Because uh, the, the, the conversation often is that uh, these developments are taking place in the north, in the global north. Uh, um, and, uh, and then it's often the, the, the uh, a continent such as Africa that uh, will receive uh, uh, um, or will benefit from, from those at the later stage. And the question is, can we develop that uh, uh, within South Africa and, and within the African continent? So Patrick Sun Siong have decided to, to utilize uh, South Africa as that intellectual hub, that manufacturing hub, uh, 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 to be able to, uh, to move from there uh, um, into the continent. And, and, uh, um, and, and what he needs to focus on uh, he needs to focus on uh, the appropriate skills that he hopefully will get from the African continent itself, from the African continent itself. Um, he will have to look at infrastructure development uh, and, and to a certain extent uh, will have to work uh, with other parts of the state and the private sector to generate a good infrastructure framework to be able to uh, 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 to launch uh, uh, that sort of larger plan that he has for the African continent, uh, and South Africa and the African continent. And then uh, thirdly, I think what is also important is that besides the, uh, uh, um, the fact that the infra infrastructure development uh, is crucial, you also have to look at how, we, how clinical trials are gonna be performed. And uh, you obviously, in the um, in the science scientific world, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, um, uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials, and and those units need to be available on the African continent. Um, and and uh, just just uh, 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 for 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 our, our viewers uh, and our participants, the University of the Free State has uh, got the only phase one uh, uh, clinical trial unit uh, um, actually in South Africa and on the African continent that have got FDA approval. Um, and, and to a certain extent, uh, um, part of the focus of uh, the strategy of Patrick Sutsiong is to see whether he can develop uh, and invest in another phase one uh, unit, uh, either in South Africa or in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, a certain part or a different part of the continent. So, so that is gonna be some of his, his key initial in investment and he's gonna to have to work uh, and he will work with certain universities. He has identified a couple of universities in South Africa that he will partner with. Uh, and I am sure that that relationship with, uh, with other universities will also uh, expand uh, not only in South Africa, but also in other parts of the, of the continent to ensure that we've got uh, universities that, that, that could assist in some of the development work, uh, but also can provide the appropriate skills uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to, 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 to yield uh, the sort of larger strategy that, that he envisage. Ultimately, uh, I think the, the larger dream besides the vaccine development would also be to see to what extent he could also uh, bring in uh, um, the, uh, the facilitation of communication, mobility, digital mobility, data, uh, um, and, and, and his businesses 
that you've got on the NAND works um, is effectively focusing in that specialization technologies, in, in communication, in, in data, uh, in mobility, uh, um, uh, obviously data analytics is quite, is quite key, and then also the utilization of artificial intelligence. So that's all part of the, of the, of the bigger plan that, uh, um, that, that Patrick has uh, for the continent. I do believe the professor is available to join us. Good day, Patrick. Can you hear us? Where you go? Patrick, where uh, you go? Eventually. <laughs> uh, eventually, uh, Dr. Patrick Sinchiong, how are you? Fine, thank you, Professor. Uh, um, well, I think we, 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 we probably had a little bit of challenges with our, our alignment with the times. Uh, um, so so uh, we, were, we were probably an hour earlier. But nevertheless, thank you for joining us. Uh, we, I already much. have introduced you to the audience. Uh, um, and uh, my, my, my host in, uh, that, that they're providing the platform is Sharon Constantion. Uh, Sharon is uh, to meet you, sir. Uh, uh, meet you. of the, of the uh, South African Chamber of Commerce in the UK. Uh, and so, so, so without further ado, because uh, I'm just worried that we might lose a uh, 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 um, a couple of our participants, uh, Patrick. I want to I want to start off by uh, by just asking you the question. I was indicating that you were born in South Africa, uh, born in an area called Kobeja, uh, uh, and and perhaps if you could just uh, give us a little bit of maybe a, a few minutes in terms of your life in South Africa. And, 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 and obviously you, you, you studied medicine at Wits University and what have triggered you to, to go abroad? Well, yes, there, I was born in Port Elizabeth and um, in a small little area where frankly you're surrounded, interesting and very much in an industrialized area. Um, right next to us was a battery factory, a tire factory, <laughs> a meat packing factory um and then we were this little shop uh, and, and then across railroad tracks was the ocean so it was this interesting environment in which i grew but i think the opportunity for me then to as i said train at, at wits and and really understand the hardships uh, that the people were suffering because i trained at baraguanus and then what was called then a non-european hospitals and um then I was able to achieve, through perseverance, a position as the first Chinese to ever be approved to work as an intern at the Johannesburg General Hospital and under Professor Bothwell and um, Duplessis, uh, who pushed on my behalf. And then I went to the TB clinics. Most of my friends um, took the amnesty that the United States offered and UK offered, I think, because there was a shortage of doctors at that time. And they gave the South African doctors with good training uh, the freedom to enter a US license without having to take the exam. I uh, decided, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so I went to the TB clinics um, in East London and uh, realized, unfortunately, that I wasn't going to help anybody. Uh, there was no infrastructure, no x-rays, no nothing and injecting them with uh, antibiotics or um, TB medications really was not only distasteful in the sense that I didn't know what I was doing on behalf of the patient and said I would leave. Uh, and the reason I said I would leave, I internally made a promise that I would leave to come back to bring infrastructure and capacity to the nation. Um, Naively, I thought it would take five years. <laughs> That's 30 years later, um, uh, maybe more. Um, I think I'm ready now and more than ready because uh, in the United States, you know, we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams in the sense that um, we built this drug called Abraxane. Um, and then uh, I developed a company that with FDA approvals had 150 um, products from scratch, from the raw material to finish full, and we made a million vials a day. Yeah. So we were the injectable source 
one of the largest companies in all of the United States. And then I sold all the companies to pursue this dream that I'm doing now, which is to activate your immune system. Um, and the concept is rather dramatic in the sense that we would treat the host and not the disease. Um, I firmly believe that all of us uh, on this planet have within ourselves a very unique cell that if we activate could treat infectious diseases, TB, HIV, uh, cancer. And that's the, the issues uh, facing us all today. So I've just pursued that and uh, now we're ready. That's fantastic. Uh, um, I, and and, and I, I would have loved to, to dig in a little bit deeper in terms of the, uh, of the medical the, the medical and biology behind it, but I want to, I want to probably jump to uh, you coming back to South Africa and hopefully the African continent. Uh, you've given an indication why you left. Uh, um, and, and, and if you could just share with us, uh, uh, Patrick, your, um, your, this project that you're bringing back to South Africa and hopefully South Africa as a springboard into the rest of the continent. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I've watched, and I'll say it openly, this vaccine apartheid, okay? Um, and it is vaccine apartheid. <laughs> I've watched with great despair this concept of ongoing colonialism. I've watched, for example, even in our country, uh, the hardships that the Apache Nation, the Navajo Nation suffer. And I think if um, we've been given this gift of these resources and this gift, I suppose, of know-how that exceeds probably most major pharmaceutical companies we have a platform of natural killer cells. We have a platform of adenovirus. We have a platform of self-amplifying RNA. We have a platform of adjuvants. We have a platform of yeast. Um, all in our hands of one organization. And I think it is almost a moral uh, obligation to do what we're doing now. Uh, but more importantly, look what happened with um, the opportunity to, to, to with Singapore. There are no resources, but Singapore has become the technical hub and the intellectual hub of Asia at one point in time. South Africa with its human capital um, and its great need could become the Singapore of Africa, indeed the Singapore of the world. So I know this sounds ambitious, but what if we built the second generation vaccine that's a pan-coronavirus vaccine that addresses many other infections and create absolute pandemic preparedness, but leading from South Africa and exporting it to the rest of the world. Which means we need to do clinical trials in South Africa, equivalent to that of what I'm doing now in the United States. We have 13 active phase two, three trials in the United States in which we're manufacturing the product from scratch all the way to finish full. And why couldn't we transport that into South Africa? So there's a lot of clearly challenges uh, that I'm going to spend the next uh, you know, three months learning about um, as I uh, get deeper. So I think the opportunity for me to really do this um, in a real practical way. So in the Western Cape, I won't name where, but uh, we already have 150,000 square feet of a manufacturing space. Soon it'll be 300,000 square feet. Uh, in the Western Cape, we will be generating the Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, we'll be working on TB. Uh, we'll in uh, Johannesburg area, we'll be working on HIV, HPV, and we already have now quite 100,000 square feet of clinical space for clinical trial space uh, next to the hospital where I trained. So we're very quietly um, going into action without a lot of fanfare. And this is the first time I've announced this now at your conference, um, <laughs> but that'll come alive. Um, and I think you'll hear more about that in December. Yeah, yeah. You mustn't forget about the free state. I, I still, you know, in our last conversation, you, 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 still, you still say you're gonna come and visit us and I'm gonna hold you for that promise, uh, uh, Patrick. 
um, and to come and come and visit our phase one uh, facility there in in in, in Bloemfontein. But but I, I want to I want to ask you. You're talking about the challenges, and, and and one can dig into those challenges. But I I want to to probably take one of those challenges, and that's the that is the provision of skills to be able to deliver on 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 uh, on what you want to deliver, and therefore collaboration with universities and science councils uh, um, is is quite crucial. What what is your what what is your strategy along those lines, Patrick? Well, I think, again, the arrogance of the Western society that says we will come in and stand up everything when, in fact, the intellectual capital exists in South Africa. In fact, just to give you some example, there are two brilliant PhD students at the University of Cape Town who were going to leave to the United States. I stopped them. They will be the first two employees. Um, of this new venture that we're creating in South Africa. So you have, or we have um, sufficient, not only ingenuity, intellectual capital. When you think of medicine, for example, the giants of medicine arose out of South Africa um, between Professor Blothwell, Professor Duplessis, Professor Mayberg, Professor Tobias, and I can go on. Obviously, uh, I'm familiar more with the uh, Fitz, but University of Cape Town had the same. And so, and then the manufacturing capacity and skill sets, it's our obligation to teach and to educate um, and to bring this um, uh, where you lift all boats, right? Um, so the opportunity for us now is to, to do that. It is going to be challenging, but that's why we excited about it. Yeah, yeah. But I think the, the other challenge uh, is, is obviously the manufacturing part. Uh, um, and that often would happen uh, outside of uh, a university environment or even a science council environment. And I was quite fascinating in one of the stories that you told was about, you started obviously in academia and then you moved to business. Uh, and what is your views on that interconnectivity between those sectors? Uh, uh, and and, and, and how, how is it helping your venture uh, uh, in your project here in South Africa? Yeah. I think, again, it's an um, incorrect characterization. When you say you went from academia to business, that's actually not what we did, actually. We went from academia in which you try to understand the biology of the human being, not to business, but to actually translation, into translating that into the clinical trial, and then into sustainability and scalability in which you can actually manufacture upstream and downstream. The latter may be called business, but it's not really business in the sense that for the sake of generating the next dollar, it's really for the sake of trying to actually put it into a human being and generate impact. If in fact you create value by actually curing the patient or creating a new treatment for pancreas cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, as we did, and it creates organic value, that creates sustainability. And if you characterize that as business, then yes. I don't see life in that sense. I don't see life in the sense of academia and business. I see life as a continuum of trying to pursue a, an impact and translating it, and most important, well, sustainability so, and scalability. So if you can generate value uh, from new knowledge, which we're generating all the time now, and scale that very quickly in a very pragmatic way, and then generate revenue so that you can sustain it. That's how, That's the way we look at uh, what we do. Yeah. So when people say, well, you become a businessman, it sort of bothers me because that's not what we do. <laughs> um, it, it generates revenue, but not for the sake of the revenue, but for the sake of actually putting back in to generate more knowledge. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, that's actually a very, very good response, Patrick, because uh, we often in at universities, uh, not only in South Africa but globally, we uh, uh, we grappling with the question what the role of universities are, and and I often say that uh, um, if universities can't impact society positively uh, uh, um, through the knowledge that we that we generating, but also the skills that we're producing, then we need to ask, you know, what what are we? Uh, and, and, and I think uh, what you, your, your response in that is a, is a very refreshing way of looking at the ecosystem 
that that look at at, at at the contribution to to society in this particular case to the patient. Um, how, how do you envisage the the link between South Africa and the rest of the continent, uh, 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 Patrick? In terms of you obviously want to bed things down first and then see how you can scale it. But have you have you got any thoughts on that at the moment? Very much so. So you know, obviously. Um, the closest sub-Saharan partners we have is Botswana and Namibia. Um, I met with the president of Botswana, President Masisi, uh, who came to visit us in Los Angeles, actually. Um, and the idea where we could actually grow from South Africa to Southern Africa, uh, to Central Africa. Uh, folks from Ghana, folks from um, uh, places like uh, Nigeria, uh, where there's some infrastructure, uh, but importantly, we should not uh, forget the um, remote areas of, of, the, of, of, of the continent. But we can't boil the ocean, right? So the idea was we need to create an infrastructure that's sustainable, as scalable, both maybe between South Africa and Botswana to start, and then move, move it all the way through uh, to the rest of the, of the continent. And then, frankly, truly be ambitious and say Africa could be the next... Um, America. I mean, there's no reason or next China. There's, then there's no reason for this continent with its multi billions of people at that time uh, to not able to export to the rest of the world uh, innovation. Yeah, and that's yeah. really what I'm going to try to do. Uh, again, how much we'll succeed, I don't know, but at least we'll make an effort. Yeah, yeah. Patrick, that's, that sounds fascinating. Uh, which you just uh, sort of tongue in the cheek? Uh, how much time would you would you spend now in the next couple of years in South Africa? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the good news is what we're doing here, right? I mean, you know, uh, when Eric Yon wanted to start Zoom, uh, which we we did together, I, I helped Eric and start the Zoom, and COVID has shown many years ago with the idea that you can communicate globally and be very effective. So, no, I'll be both in South Africa and I'll be both in the uh, United States, and I think the opportunity to cross fertilize. Um, I'll spend as much time as I need uh, in South Africa so that we can ensure that feet on the ground, we have people on the ground. Yeah, yeah. So Patrick, a part of your your, your business uh, uh, is, is, is also communication, artificial intelligence, mobility, data, uh, um, a lot of innovation in that, in, in that regard. And the COVID-19, Pandemic and really, besides the COVID, the COVID, the vaccine itself, uh, and you're talking about vaccine nationalism, uh, you use the, the, the term apartheid uh, and, and colonialism, colonial influence there. Um, what about the digital divide? Uh, uh, that, that, that obviously is, 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 is also being, being shown quite clearly in, the, in, the, in, in, in COVID 19 uh, or through COVID 19. Are there any parts of that? Of your business that's also focusing on that uh, whilst this is a venture in South Africa and the rest of the continent? So, you know, when I talked about sustainability and scalability, um, there's no capability of setting up scalability if you don't have power or water. Without power, water and, um, and digital interconnection, all of that you can't then take advantage or harness the 21st century technology. I faced that in the United States. So uh, many, many years ago, uh, we took over the National Lambda Rail, which is the fiber infrastructure that ran the Large Hadron Collider from Bern to the United States. And it interconnected all the major academic centers at 10 gigabits per second. I thought that was too slow. Um, so we ran it for four years and basically shut it down so that I could rebuild an organization called Mox Networks. So Mox Networks now had 300,000 fiber miles across the country, United States, all the way to Tokyo, all the way to UK, and can move data terabits a second. Now we have a data infrastructure tied to supercomputing, and we have about connected to about 150 data centers. Why we're doing that? Well, the only way to, to understand the molecular uh, mechanism and protein-protein interaction at that kind of level 
and do three-dimensional analysis of a CAT scan and MRI. You need this kind of supercomputing power. And that's what we are doing. So there's a company called Zyosoft where we take data right out of the MRI that I, I, I run in which we can now do three-dimensional analysis of a beating heart. All of that requires, however, the internet. Um, the internet requires electricity. Electricity requires um, uh, solar and lithium and batteries, and um, and that's what we're in. Um, so there's a purpose for why we get into industries, um, because unless you don't have the sustainability, and it turns out there's an urgency on climate change. So there's existential issues that humanity doesn't quite fully understand. One is exactly what's facing us now. A drug resistant TB is, on the, is going to be here, Zika, Nipah, coronavirus, uh, climate change, where the tipping point is maybe have already been reached, who knows? Um, I, I don't think as a species, frankly, we enlightened enough to understand that we may not survive. <laughs> That's scary, but it may not be in your lifetime, but you've got children or grandchildren and great, great, great grandchildren. And you think about uh, what we're doing to each other, um, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So if you ask what um, cr um, industries I'm in, we're trying to figure out really from a very macro perspective what affects mankind and what we can do about it. And more importantly, how we can bring technology to bear. Mm -hmm. that is, uh, that's quite fascinating. And I'm, I'm looking at the time here. Uh, uh, and it's, 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 it's just such a pity that our, our clocks weren't aligned because I would have liked to have a much longer conversation with you, uh, Patrick. But I'm certainly, I certainly would link up with you again when, you, when you're back in South Africa. I should say back in South Africa uh, to see whether, whether we could have you at our university also at some point uh, uh, and, and maybe talking to a larger, a larger audience. But uh, I certainly, from my side, before I give back to Sharon Constantion, just to make a few closing remarks, would like to say thank you very much, uh, uh, Patrick, for, uh, for, for the way in which you have uh, responded to the questions, but effectively just articulated your project uh, uh, as more than a dream. Uh, it's actually a dream that will become and can become a reality uh, for South Africa and scaling it uh, onto the continent. And then uh, um, uh, try to challenge the narrative that uh, you know that the African continent uh, is, is always on the receiving side uh, uh, um, and, and and would not be able to contribute uh, well, what, uh, to what, to the club. What's really exciting, and you know, I'm just, I'm actually presenting this talk in two or three days' time, where we will announce not only the second generation COVID vaccine, but more importantly how our vaccine cross reacts with the common cold, uh, a coronavirus, and how we have memory B and T cells. And that those platforms of both the adenovirus self-amplifying RNA subunit protein, all three of them, um, I will be manufactured in South Africa literally within, as soon as uh, we can get a standard up. In the meantime, we're doing the trials right now in the United States and South Africa. We believe very strongly that unless we get this T cell um, and what I call memory T cell, memory B cell, which I'm presenting the data for the first time to the public in the next three or four days, um, in which our patients that have received the vaccine now have these memory B and T cells. This is what I'm gonna launch from South Africa. This is what this country, your country, our country will have. They'll be able to maybe be the answer, but even not for COVID across the world. So uh, that's not just an ambition and um, and the data will, uh, which we have unpublished, I'm presenting for the first time next couple of days, will really, uh, I think, be very exciting. Fantastic, uh, Patrick, and congratulations. And I certainly uh, will meet up with you when, uh, try to meet up with you in New South Africa. I'm going to give back to Sharon, uh, our host. And uh, Sharon, you can, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. I have to say, it's a riveting conversation We've had a couple of texts coming through to the same uh, effect. I have to say, Patrick, I've never felt so insignificant, unknowledgeable, stupid in the in the content and, and in the presence of someone talking about such big things. I mean, 
and you talked about it we are, are as a world are our minds big enough to work out that we might not survive that was a really um, quite a profound moment when you said that that makes us think actually we are not immortal we can't assume we're going to survive that our planet's going to survive and it's somebody else's problem and i just thought that was probably out of everything you said just such a line in the sand moment that i hope that things like cop 26 things like what you were doing will make us realize that we actually have to take ownership of this changing agenda if we're going to survive so i thank you so much for that that part of making me feel so insignificant but you did give me a wake-up moment in a very different way but what i really appreciate from you um is a life commitment to do the right thing by your knowledge and by what you believe in and what you believe can be found that you haven't quite found yet in to a degree and i really admire that because so many of us don't stretch ourselves in the way you are doing and if they do they'll do it for the dollar as you said not necessarily for humanity and for the future of humanity and the thing that you alluded to as well um, I, I work in the corporate governance world and one of the things we talk about is business sustainability uh, so profit has to occur because if you haven't got some kind of a return to reinvest you are not sustainable and you alluded to that in your conversation which was very um, welcoming to see the drug does surprise all of us and i'm sure you scientists are surprised we are um I don't know where it's going and I hope it's going to be looked after by the likes of people like you uh, in this industry. But I do look forward to seeing South Africa being the leader, giving, delivering into Africa and seeing Africa potentially this being its step up moment in the global uh, world of the next 50 years that Africa is going to play globally because we will at least survive that long and by then we will survive forever because we'll have learned the tricks you will make sure we all have to learn in that period of time do you have any last words you'd like to share with us before we end no no thank you for that summation i think um exactly what you just said the concern is do we think big enough smart enough and more importantly do we have a leadership political leadership that actually sees it that way and even in our country um you, you know, the, the political leadership seems to be the only agenda is the next election versus um, really looking at long term uh, for good of all humanity uh, and their own individual countries. And the, to me, that's been a frustrating moment, especially um, as we I watch uh, the dogma of all the current treatments. If you look at cancer, the high dose chemotherapy just persists. If you look at COVID, the use of antibodies that we know will variants will work around persists and and you just keep on going on so um I, i'm glad i sort of struck a chord that we're not sufficiently enlightened and if we can actually get to a few people uh in positions of really authority impact making not politically uh, but really trying to actually do something and i thought that maybe the only way out of frustration my perspective is to to try this in south africa well i know south africa will be extremely grateful for your knowledge your mission and the fact that south africa will economically benefit and the people will benefit because they will have the immunity that they require so i see south africa benefiting in many ways from the project that you have got started and thank you for using the South African Chamber as a platform to announce some of your groundbreaking information. We are honored and we'll make sure that this is available to the marketplace. And I look forward to picking up with you in potentially six months time or so to understand what progress you have made and look to see whether the Chamber can offer any support. And in that context, we'll make direct contact with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your time. And Thank once you, again, Patrick. apologies that diaries have time, time changes between summer and winter at different times of the year, because that's clearly what has occurred. And I thank um, Francis 
for being able to keep a conversation going that was due to be five minutes. He managed it to last 50 minutes. So well done, <laughs> sir. You really did a, a phenomenal job. Um, obviously, standing in front of students and trying to sound intelligent, you've got down to an absolute art because we did learn a lot about you, Patrick, in the process. Uh, so thank you very much, Francis. You held your own extremely well. And um, Professor, um, I'm not going to try and say your surname. Patrick, I hope this is respectful enough. Thank you so much for your insights. Okay, you're thank welcome. You. Bye bye. To the rest thank of you. the chamber Thanks. and thank to those that are still present with us, of which there are many, thank goodness. I really appreciate you staying on and we'll be sharing the video as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you.